Welcome back to the channel, everybody. My name is Breezy, and today we're going to be bringing you a look at my Viscerite deck. That's right. This is uh, one that I've been having a ton of fun with and lots of great results, at least as far as Talishar goes. And we all know, you know, we know what that means, right? It's it's a S tier deck is what it means. Uh, but yeah, this is the uh, Scrooge McRoon. I have to give a big shout out to Hamish over at Push the Point uh, because uh, he really inspired me to take a, another look at the list that I was working on uh, whenever I was working on trying to figure out what the Sonata Galaxia card did. Um, some of you may remember, but I did spoil that card for uh, the heavy hitters. It was an expansion slot, and I was racking my brain for about a month just trying to figure out what that card was going to be used for, what their ideas uh, for implementing that into the Rune Blade card pool. So I built a, basically a version of this list that we're going to be going through. But long story short, Hamish really reignited that flame in me and made me internally say, hey, you should give that another look. And I did. And it turns out the list is awesome. So you will see some inspiration taken from uh, them. If you haven't checked out his video, I'll leave a link down in the description for you to definitely go check out an amazing content creator you should definitely be supporting. Anyway, we are running Arcanite Skullcap. Yes, that's right. We're not only dusting off Viscerai, we're dusting off the Skullcap. It's back in, baby. Mostly because we like to prioritize our health total and we get three block out of this nine times out of ten. We're usually at a lower life threshold than our opponent uh, just due to the play style that we're, we're running here. Uh, and uh, what I found was that uh, Crown of Providence was just that one-time use. Yes, it's great to fix your hand or maybe a card that you got stuck in arsenal but what that teaches us is to just uh, try not to arsenal weird stuff be a little bit more diligent about what cards we arsenal and uh yeah i think you overall utilize the block value of the skull cap just way more so obviously you'll block with it uh the first time and you'll uh, be able to block with it for two because you'll probably have uh, less life than your opponent and then you'll put the counter on it and you'll be able to block again with it because you will also still have less life than your opponent. You can play some tricky things here by allowing yourself to like intentionally take a point or two more damage just to get you below their life and then, you know, activate the or it turns the skull cap back on, I guess you could say. So skull cap is a big win and like for the price point right now, it's like the best entry level generic legendary headpiece right now. Bloodied Oval. Okay, so I didn't have this in the list when I was tinkering with it for heavy hitters because I didn't know this card existed uh, at the time, but Hamish's list re uh, showed me this and I was like, yeah, it's great because I was using Scepter of Pain in my list because I was like, yeah, let's just build Rune Chance, but I didn't have anything to put in my offhand. And now we do with the bloodied oval because this says bloodied ovals defense is equal to the number of opposing heroes with a greater life than you it's going to be one so it's going to block for one don't use it right away it's actually much more valuable than it than it than you might think it is uh just that one singular block is huge of course we're running a fiendal spring tunic in this particular build um because that resource every three turns is huge we are going to be blocking a lot and so uh, sometimes we just need that one resource for that one card hand uh, for certain cards which we'll get to in a second all right next we have the grasp of the arc knight which is a no-brainer uh, especially in viscerai but i'd say in any rune blade now or in the future these arms are going to be a staple a test of time they're just fantastic because it's a once per turn pay two, create a rune chant token and then you can pay an additional one on top of the two for every rune chant you have if you have two rune chants you could easily if you have a bunch of blues in hand you could easily just pay a bunch and create a rune chant kind of clear your hand a little bit uh, but m another very important thing is is that this blocks for two and then it will block for another one because it has battle worn so does not break, which is fantastic, and yeah, say less, right? So, Scepter of Pain, I mentioned this, that we're going to be running Scepter of Pain because it is uh, going to preserve our rune chance, right? So, the whole name of the game is Stack Rune Chance. This is why we call this deck Scrooge McRune, Scrooge McDuck, uh, notably loved to stack his coin sky high, and that is what we're going to be doing with rune chance so these rune chance will not pop whenever we pay two and uh attempt to deal one arcane damage to our, our, our 
opponent late game, this gets really annoying and they're not going to always pitch to it. So we're going to be able to uh, create a rune chant on every now and then turn. Let's say that it's fantastic because it doesn't have a physical uh, attribute. It does not hit for physical uh, qualities, so it will not pop your rune chants. And that's exactly what we need. Spellbound creepers. There's a few times I could probably count on one hand that I've actually like done anything cool with spellbound creepers in this particular build. Like nine times out of ten, it's a one block. So, but it's a fancy one block and it's a beautiful one block. So, uh, but yeah, the, having the option there to do some instant speech shenanigans is awesome, but don't count on it every game as if you were playing like a Mavrian sky shrill of the skull form style viscerai. This is very different, a very different mindset. Amplify the Arc Knight. Amplify the Arc Knight is one of those ones that I've taken out and put back in and taken out and put back in, but it is so important to this list because after we have a big pop-off turn, we need to have some solid attacks, especially with this discount of uh, it costing one less for each rune chain you control. It's fantastic, right? Um, so it's usually going to be coming in with six and then some amount of rune chance. So the split damage, especially late game, is huge. And so for that reason, it stays in the list. But don't be afraid to block with this because we do have some rattle bones in here and things of that nature. So we don't, you know, don't be too scared to block with it. All right. So next up, we have Blessing of a Cult, a card from Dynasty that just. In my opinion, I didn't think it was ever going to see any play, but it is fantastic. And that is all thanks to Sonata Galaxia, which we will get to here shortly. At the start of your turn, you destroy this and you create three rune chants. It's just a slow burn read the runes or a fast burn rune blood incantation. Essentially does the same thing as those two cards I just mentioned, but at a single resource and no go again. <clears throat> so, you know, take it or leave it. It is a fantastic card. It has to be in this deck because it is a rune blade aura and it only costs one. Yeah, that's right. We're going to get into some auras in this list. As you can tell, fate foreseen, as I mentioned, we are blocking with this list. We are hoarding our coin. We are scrooging McRooning right now. We are not letting uh, anything happen until we are ready for it to happen, which means we need to be prepared to block and stay on the defensive side until we are ready to do so. So Fate for Scene is fantastic uh, for that reason. Blocks for four, we all know the drill. Mordred Tide, admittedly, this becomes a blocker. You have to change your mindset going into this list because any other Viscerai list and Mordred Tide is like this sacred key to like doing big cool things. But in this list, you just can't get greedy enough to hold on to it and something else, and something else in order to trigger Viscerai and the card that you want to play. It's just, it's a, it's a lot to, to do, especially with this particular build. So for that reason, sometimes it's just okay to block with it. Of course, you play it when you can. If I had this in Arsenal and a Read the Runes in hand, I'm keeping it. But if I have this and some like weird hodgepodge of cards, it is just a block three. Uh, so it's fantastic into like warrior matchups where they're throwing sabers at you and they're trying to punish you for attack actions and stuff. This is fantastic. So Mordratide is in the list for that reason. Rattlebones, another three block uh, non-attack action. But in this particular case, we don't want to block with these. We want to keep these in the deck as much as possible because when we're blocking with our Amplify the Arc Knight or our Ninth Blade of the Blood Oath or even a Swarming Gloom Veil, we want to be able to go get it from our graveyard. So these cards you're actually not wanting to block with. If you're having to block with this, it's not the best. And for that reason, I'm running two. I really couldn't justify running three. It just didn't feel good. Uh, I saw it too often when I didn't need it, and then I was definitely blocking with it, and I got in this mindset of like, it's okay to block with Rattlebones. It's really not. It is actually a key component late game if you need to pop off with a Ninth Blade of the Blood Oath and you just can't wait to go find it. It's okay to, to just have a Rattlebones, and uh, you definitely didn't want to block with that earlier in the game. Read the runes. Create three rune chants for nothing. Say less. That's it. That's all it does. <laughs> it's fantastic. Uh, reduced to rune chance. So similar to fate for scene idea, we're going to be blocking, except this time when we block, we get rewarded in with uh, rune chance, right? So blocks four. it does cost one, but its cost is reduced by how many rune chance you have. So if you have a singular rune chant, this is free and you not only have a singular rune chant anymore, you've blocked four, and now you have two rune chance. 
it couldn't be any better. Uh, so yeah, we're blocking four as a defense reaction and getting a rune chant, which is the whole name of the game in the first place. This does both of those things. Keeps you alive and makes your rune chants. It's fantastic. And for that reason, we're running three yellows as well because sometimes an attack isn't always coming in for four or, or something like that. Sometimes it comes in for three or seven. And maybe you have a fate for seeing it and a yellow reduce the rune chant. You've just fully blocked their whole turn without wasted uh, defensive values, and you made a rune chant. Yellows are fantastic also because that's exactly how much it costs to deal one point of arcane with the Scepter of Pain. So yellow pitches, we are not afraid to put them in this, in this particular list because Scepter of Pain has that perfect cost, and uh, it does all the things we need it to, right? So blocks, rune chants, pays for things, no-brainer. Uh, similar to Blessing of a Cult, we've got Rune Blood Incantation, another one cost aura, but this time it does have go again, but it's a slow burn uh, rune chant production, so you put the three verse counters on it. At the start of your turn, you remove one of those counters, and instead, you, uh, or I guess in place of it, you make a rune chant. So definitely need these for the long game. If you're up against a match that you know is just going to be like KO, for instance, like in KO, I'm really, unless I see this turn one or turn two, I'm not digging for this card. It's just the games are pretty quick uh, if if they allow it. So you can't rely on your uh, rune chant generations to solely come from rune blood incantations. But uh, that's not definitive. You know, when you see it and it makes sense, you definitely play it. Again, plays very well off of that one resource from Tunic. So it is fantastic. Play one of these. Has go again. Play a read the runes and you've generated a rune chant from Viscerai's ability and read the runes, you're at four, and then on the start of your next turn, you'll take a counter off of this, go up to five. It's super, super easy to make a ton of rune chants very, very quickly with this particular list, and incantation definitely plays a part in that. And again, I'll, pref I'll, I'll remind you, this is an aura, so we want to keep that in mind. Uh, Sigil of Suffering, we're running the three of because it's, again, it's a, it's, it's, it, act, it acts as if a, it's a yellow reduce the rune chant in the fact that it blocks for three. It does not create you the rune chant, but it does threaten to deal a single point of damage unless your opponent, you know, pitches into arcane. And if they don't, this actually blocks for four. Uh, I've killed my opponent with a Sigil of Suffering, uh, because they were at one life and they just couldn't pay for it. They tried to chunk all of their cards at me to have one last two raw. And it was a sad day because one of these sigil of sufferings made them pay for it. So uh, this is a fantastic, fantastic defense reaction. And it still provides you that point of damage similar to reduce the rune chant, but it immediately deals uh, that damage to them. So um, yeah. And if they take it, they then this gets buffed up to a four block and it costs nothing. So yeah, it's fantastic. Uh, sink below again, <laughs> It's another defense reaction and helps fix your hand. Uh, I love this card. It just makes so much sense in this deck, especially as you're just trying to filter through your deck. You can sink a card, draw a new one. You know, we know the drill. All right, so this is the brainchild of what kind of caused all of this, the, the catalyst that drove my brain into this mode of playing this type of a deck, or at least building this type of a deck, uh, is, you know, this is Sonata Galaxia. This says this costs one less to play for each rune chain you control. Search your deck for a rune blade aura with cost X or less. Put it into the arena, then shuffle. If X is two or more, it gets go again, which is was at the time when I read this as a spoiler. I was like, this makes no sense. I, rune blade auras. People are people aren't gonna play rune blade auras. We blessing of a cult, looming doom. Nah. And so it took me a, the only thing that I could figure to do in order to try to solve what this card was wanting was to just plug literally every aura into a deck. And figure out what that deck wanted to be and it turns out it wanted to be a rune chant generating deck and if you want to do that you're not going to be attacking much so that's where all the defense reactions and things like that uh started to make sense um now i know for a fact that i'm not the only one or the first one that was trying to make a like otk style uh viscerai work before this card happened uh so i definitely don't claim any like authority or like I've struck gold or anything with this list. I will say though that when I had this card, there wasn't much that I could say 
to spoil it until I was ready to spoil it. So, and then even then I'd kind of put the list on the, on the shelf because I was like exploring KO and like, what is this new Kasai doing that I like somewhat kind of forgot where I was headed with this list until again, like I mentioned, Hamish's, uh, from push the point and they, they did, the, he did the video and I was like, Oh yeah, that's right. I was like scratching at something and I forgot. So yeah, this was the whole, this is the whole reason that this list even kind of operates. This was the kind of the missing link, uh, to the rune chant stacking. Let's make this make sense play style for viscerai in 2024. Uh, so yeah, this essentially allows you to go grab your auras like blessing of a cult rune blood incantation, uh, rune blood barrier. And then of course, looming doom, uh, which, you know, at the time, none of those, well, maybe Runeblood Incantation was still seeing play on occasion, but, you know, uh, Blessing of a Cult, Runeblood Barrier, and Looming Doom were really just not seeing, like, mainline play. So this card has allowed uh, those cards to make sense in here because we can go fetch them at any point in time as long as, you know, you, you typically aren't going to be wanting to pay out of hand for this. You want your resources to be in the form of rune chance. It's very simple to get up to six to nine rune chance by turn three. So you should never really have to worry about paying for this, though if you do have to, it's probably only going to be like a single resource or something. Fantastic card, absolutely critical to what makes this list make sense. Moving on to Swarming Gloomvale. Uh, we all know what this card does if you're a Viscerai player or if you've ever played against a Runeblade in general. Um, if you've played one or played or created one or more auras this turn, Swarming Gloomvale, yeah, 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 gets go again. This card is, there's a reason why there's only two. You don't want to see this often, right? So there is, there's a, there is a reason or there could be a debate as to having two Amplify the Arknights and three Swarm and Gloom Veils. It doesn't really matter. I just found that it, I don't want a ton of Swarm and Gloom Veils in my hand, or at least drawing into them frequently, because it just doesn't feel good when you're sitting at like 14 Rune Chance and you're just not ready to pop off. You're going to block with them anyway. So since you're going to block with them anyway, you want them late game for uh, some like kind of pseudo old school like Mavrian Skies combo turns with rattle bones into swarm and gloom veil and then into like a scepter of pain or something and then by that point you might have looming doom with some counters on it so that's going to ping them for some more damage uh, it hurts my feelings to only have two swarm and gloom veil two swarm and gloom veil in this list but hey it is what it is ninth blade of the blood oath this is what i'm talking about this is the whole uh this is the whole reason why rune chants are cool in the first place right because we want to do tons of damage with rune chance and split damage with physical damage to the point to where your opponent's just like because it costs nine hits for nine and uh yeah that's pretty much it have at least nine rune chance before you play this people it's uh, kind of goes without saying you don't really want to pay for this you don't want to have six rune chance and pay a blue for this it just doesn't make any sense so the only way this makes sense is with nine rune chance at least bonus points if you have like 30 which is very very doable but this is not the only way to kill your opponent with rune chance uh, like i mentioned earlier looming doom is a very viable option but we'll get, talk about that when we get to it but uh this is fantastic especially into the faster games when you just can't set up those longer looming doom stuff and you just need to present like 38 damage real quick ninth blade of the blood oath is the way you're going to do it again don't be afraid to block with this rattle bones it got your back if you need it. So Rune Blood Barrier. Now there's something special about Rune Blood Barrier here. There's um, it's a three cost. So you want to have, you know, if you're gonna Sonata a Galaxia this, you have to at least have six Rune Chance, and you can go get this for free. It will have Go Again, uh, but you'll just instantly create four Rune Chance on top of the maybe twelve you already have because you're just stacking and racking them. Uh, and it says if your hero would be dealt damage instead destroy that many rune chance you control and prevent one damage that source would deal for each rune chant des destroyed this way and then at the beginning of your turn this just goes away uh, you don't want to lose a bunch of rune chance you definitely don't want to throw a rune blood barrier out and then just not block you want this to be a very simple create four rune chance and then hold on to as many as possible 
Uh, so you know, let's say you have 16 rune chance play this, you go up to 20. If by the start of your next turn you've maybe lost two or three, that's not a big deal. You're still net positive on playing this card and you've preserved life. But you definitely don't want to just like take 10 and lose 10 rune chance. But yes, in a, in a at a certain point in time, if you need to and just hold on to your life, it's totally fine. If you, there's nothing you can do about it and Bravo just crippling crush dominates you in the face, there's not much you can do besides lose some rune chance, but hey, at least the on hit effect didn't happen and he didn't get the satisfaction uh, that there that he was looking for. So it does come in handy for those particular moments, uh, but treat this as a rune chant generator more so than a um, defensive card. So, uh, But there's something really cool that you can do here with uh, rune blood barrier in the, in the sense that you can play uh, let's see, so you'd have like Sonata Galaxia in Arsenal. You play it, you have at least, let's say you have, let's say you have the 16 rune chance, right? You play this, you go get rune blood barrier. Fantastic. It has go again. All of a sudden you have 20 rune chance. As long as you have a blue and looming doom in your hand, you can then drop down your looming doom with, with, uh, 20 counters <laughs> with 20 counters on it. That's 40 damage over the course of the game split into two doses of arcane coming at your opponent. So like you can string together some fun stuff. You could Sonata Galaxia, find Rune Blood Barrier has go again. And with your tunic counter, go get a, a blessing of a cult. You know, like there's some, there's some very fun things you can do with Sonata into Rune Blood Barrier and then continue your turn. It is fantastic. Become the Arknight is so valuable in this list because not only is it a blue, it blocks for three, but because it's probably one of the best tutors in the game. I mean, these are the Arcane Rising days when, you know, Kano, Azalea, everyone had their tutor cards, right? You play this, discard a non-attack action card, and you will go find an attack action card. On the other side of the coin, if you discard an attack action, you can go search your deck for a non-attack action. So... Tons of play pattern options here. This literally, this this one card literally opens up your entire deck um, because you can play this right here, discard a non-attack action, maybe Oath of the Arknight or something right here, and then go get your ninth blade and then force your pop off if you're really just hurting to stay alive and you need to put some pressure on your opponent and pop off a bunch of damage at them. Or on the other side, if you want to become the Arc Knight here, discard a ninth blood because you saw it a little too early. That's okay. It's okay if that ends up in your graveyard because we have Rattlebones, remember. Uh, and then go get Sonata Galaxia and play Sonata Galaxia to put out a Rune Blood Barrier to help defense a little bit of your defense. Or maybe you just go get your Looming Doom right off of that. And that's when you start your slow burn process. So become the Ark Knight. You cannot live, you cannot build this deck without this card. It's just point blank. You need become the Ark Knight. So uh, let it be known. Looming Doom. This is one of the win conditions of this deck, right? Because it says when Looming Doom enters the arena, destroy all rune chains you control and put that many Doom counters on Looming Doom. At the beginning of your end phase, remove a Doom counter and Looming, and if you do, uh, deal two arcane damage to any target. Otherwise, destroy Looming Doom. So there is a time and a place that you want to play Looming Doom into, you know, very fast matchups it does not make sense to play Looming Doom because the game will be over. Let's say you put, let's say you built 20 rune chance, right? We'll still keep using that number. You, you built 20 rune chance and you're going to get a Looming Doom against, a, you know, a hyper aggro deck list. That card is going to hurt them. It will do some damage, but it will not end the game for you. What's going to end the game for you is the Ninth Bloods, the Amplify the Arc Knights, the Swarming Gloomfield combos that you can string together with like a bunch of rune chance and stuff. You do need to rely on physical damage for those um, those matchups. But for the slower processed games like Guardians, you know, um, Victor, you know, he's out there, Teclo uh, there are some slower mid-range to like slower play heroes right now. And Looming Doom is going to, uh, on the surface, not scare them. They're going to be like, ha, that's funny until they're down to like six or four or sub 10 life, essentially. And it's going to be a very, very big problem for them, especially because people are bringing AB1 into this list. Uh, though I think not for long, people are just going to start running AB2, which is the other point I want to make that if people start running Arcane Barrier 2, you just don't 
play looming doom, right? You just don't uh, because they will always pitch to it and you will deck out and you will lose. So the best thing you can do is continue the plan of building a rune chance and then hit them with physical damage because they have to respond to 48 rune chance and nine damage. That's just what they have to, <laughs> you know, they or they, or they don't, you'd prefer they don't, but the whole plan, the whole point is, is if someone shows up with AB 12, don't play looming doom. And I've had a few people tell me, Oh, well you just deck just crumbles to AB two. It doesn't because, uh, I've played it into AB2 heroes who thought they had the up, upper hand on me and you just hit them in the face with a bajillion rune chance because you don't have to dump them into Looming Doom. You just get to keep stacking them and their knees start to shake when they see 30 plus, 40 plus rune chance on the stack just waiting, uh, you know, and then a Looming Doom waiting behind it. It's a terrifying thing for your opponent to deal with. And we've got all the blocking power in the world, so... It's bound to happen. If you're bound to get that many rune chance, it's just going to happen. So don't feel like this is the one all be all uh, win condition for this particular list because it's not. Although it is one of them, it is not the only, I guess I should say. Oath of the Ark Knight Blue is amazing. I don't know how that more times than not, I've played this card into a uh, ninth blade and just said, here's one more rune chant <laughs> and it's 10. It's not nine anymore. It's 10 now. Uh, so, and it blocks for three and it block, it's a blue pitch. So it's fantastic. You're most likely going to be blocking with this, but like I just mentioned, if you can play it, you should play it. It's great. Sift. Sift is the sleeper of this deck because it's a hand correction. Uh, it's a zero cost blue block three. And it says put up to two cards from your hand on the bottom of your deck, then draw that many cards. Now, remember, if you do play this, you have to put at least one card to the bottom of your deck. You can't just play this and then carry about your day with something else to trigger a Viscera rune chant creation thing. You do have to put a card on the bottom of your deck. I made that mistake once. That's why I mentioned it. I was like, oh yeah, I didn't really want to get rid of either of these two cards, but uh, I guess I have to. So just keep that in mind. Uh, but it is a, again, it blocks for three, pitches for blue, and is a great way to cycle through the deck and try to get you know, find your Sonata Galaxias, your Ninth Blade of the Blood Oath, your Looming Dooms, whatever it might be. Um, yeah, so there's been many a time where I've had Sift and two Ninth Blade in my hand, and you're just like, play Sift, buy Ninth Blades, get away from me, see you in a little bit, and uh, comes in comes in all kinds of sorts of handy. So keep that in mind. Sift is the sleeper of this of this deck. Vexing Malice literally wins you games particularly into heroes that only carry around AB1. So um, just never take it out of the deck, literally, ever. I don't care what Viscera you're playing, what Runeblade hero you're playing. Play Vexing Malice. I have won more games with Vexing Malice than I have with Looming Doom or Ninth Blade of the Blood Oath. <laughs> it's just that good of a card. The deal to arcane damage is insane, especially when you have a Looming Doom that they just can't deal with and they're at two life it's just the game is over so i don't need to say anymore you've heard enough vexing malice is a game ender warmonger's diplomacy not a card you typically want to be playing in a viscerai list but in this particular one it's uh, another blue and it blocks for three <laughs> and it's free to play and against heroes that like to play a lot of non-attacks into attacks uh this card is fantastic you know your warriors are starting to play a lot of attack at, or, or sorry non-attacks into it like it's a buff or something your next you know thing gets you know, outland skirmish gives your next sword plus three okay play it so warmonger's diplomacy has a place right now in the meta and it's, still, it's i think it's still going to moving forward as long as anyone wants to do both things right whether they want to play a non-attack action and an attack action um it's got a great place and if they don't it just blocks and that's totally fine or you can pitch it into uh, rune blood incantation and then with your two floating you just scepter a pain warmonger's diplomacy and last but not least in the main board never comes out of the list we've got whisper of the oracle this is another zero cost blue block three uh, you're starting to see a pattern here that these are very valuable cards uh, opt two. look at the top two cards of your deck you may put them on the on the top or bottom in any order there's a time and place when you want to play this 
it definitely, I don't know how many times I've like done a, you know, a uh, whisper of the Oracle found, saw something that I just really didn't want to see right then and there tucked both to the bottom and drew up into like a perfect combination of defense reactions or something. It's just such a good card. Uh, and playing it into another, into a rune blade card will trigger viscerai. So, you know, you have that going for you. It's a rune chant generator in a pseudo sense and it blocks three and it does all the things that you want it to do. I should mention this is a 64 card core deck. That's right. We don't run 60s. Not with the style like this. Scrooge McRune, I almost said Scrooge McRune, Scrooge McRune likes to uh, play the long game. And with the long game, you're playing a lot of cards. You're blocking a lot. You're building a lot of rune chance. You don't want to run out of cards. I've ended many games with one to four cards left in my deck, and it is terrifying, but you just get there somehow. But 64 feels like a great number, and I would even go so much as to say you're going to throw three of or a three of into the deck depending on who your matchup is. Going against Bravo, Leviah, uh, Ko, uh, Azalea, put unmovables in the list. Don't take anything out. You don't need to take anything out. Just put unmovables in the list. It's totally fine. The more cards you have, honestly, with this particular build, because you're just slow rolling this list, the better. You're not really itching to get to a certain card. You've got a tutor right here that can go find you things. You've got a tutor right here that can go find you things. The magic number of 60 kind of goes out the window. And I've played with 60 and it just, you, you're, you're going to deck out. You're, you are going to run out of cards. So 64 card core with the addition of three unmovables or three that all you got, which is a fantastic card, especially into Kasai's Sabres right now, Fai or uh, Katsu with their uh, Kadachis. Um, you know, the list goes on uh, Rachne with the uh, Spider's Bites or whatever they, they decide to run into you. That's the list. I mean, we've got Arcane Lantern here for an offhand because we do have an offhand this is for kano i guess uh mostly i haven't really faced up into too many kanos uh dyadic carapace is there also for kano this blocks well and it does but uh i value my tunic resource um a lot more than i do the two block here i've tried it and it just feels a little clunky like i find myself itching for that one resource more than i it, find myself itching for oh, if only i could have blocked two more it's always if only i had that last resource i could have done these cool things so i don't I, this is here i don't play it it's just it's a pretty card and it has arcane bear too so Vexing Quillhand is in the list as well for the Arcane Barrier. Look at this. We can run AB4 if we want to. We've got a ton of blues, a ton of yellows for the wizard matchup. Uh, but I, I, I don't know. It, it's also like if you really want to, as like a budget Grasp of the Arc Knight, you could play this uh, and just crack it and get to Rune Chance really quickly if you want. I don't know. You tell me. And last but not least is the Balance of Justice, the newest generic legendary headpiece from Heavy Hitters. Uh, it's got an instant ability to destroy it and you draw a card. You can only activate this ability when your opponent has drawn two or more cards during that turn. It's got Guard Well, which is a new keyword, which means uh, when the combat chain closes, uh, you put minus one counters on it equal to the uh, value. So it just blocks for two. You put minus two counters on it, and then that's it. It doesn't break. You only break this. The only way to break this is if you're doing its ability here with the instant speed stuff. Only carrying this into Brutes because Blood Rush Bellow is nasty. Um, even into, like, Fi and, like, Ninjas and stuff, it doesn't make sense for me because I would much rather have the additional single point of block there, I think. Uh, and they're not always drawing two cards during your turn, right? So, uh, yes, they play Art of War and things like that, but it's it's totally fine. Um, I have, it's not a big deal. So, Brutes, this is your tech right here. That's it. That's the list. That is Scrooge McRoon. You know, it's RTN season right now, so maybe if you feel a little gutsy, you feel like your meta at your, you know, in your local scene is just not ready or not expecting this kind of a viscerai, you will smoke the field. It is 
a huge contender right now. Uh, let's just say that. If you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to leave it a like and subscribe to the channel so you don't, uh, you know, miss out on the progress that Viscerai is going to be making over the course of time because that's what we're here to do. We're talking about Viscerai, baby. That's what we do here. Uh, but yeah, also leave me the comments down below and let me know if this list is working for you, if you enjoy the list, all kinds of stuff. Just drop me a comment. Let's talk about it. All right. All right. Until next time, I'll see you later. Adios.